now into another three weeks of lockdown but here we are on a Friday morning ready to bring you something really quite exciting and that is a fantastic Q&A with Tatiana Waldrich or Tati. Hi Tati. Hi. <laughs> um, Tati is here to talk to us about her experience as a grassroots eventer and she's got a fascinating background in something which not so many of us have an insight into which is the <laughs> polo world. Um, so she's going to be answering questions this morning about grassroots eventing, how she got into it. Tati's also one of our Flying Changes Coaching Ambassadors for this year. So we've known each other a few months now. Um, and so we're going to be talking about her journey and things like that. So welcome, Tati. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> you're very welcome. So tell us a little bit then about where you're at now, what's going on for you. I mean, a little bit, okay, right now, like probably. So right now, I'm just in quarantine at home uh, <laughs> on lockdown, but currently kind of in my eventing career as such I am kind of competing at BE90 I was hoping to be doing some 100s round about now but obviously that hasn't really happened so um just kind of stepping up a level now so I'm starting to practice instead of prelim tests in say dressage more novice tests you know just stepping it up one um jumping a bit bigger so just going above 90 now really um to start doing the bigger stuff bit more complicated as well as as the eventers will know you know b90 tests are pretty simple um and b100 tests you know there's a few more things to ask so uh yeah it's interesting cool and what is it that you love about eventing because i know you've not come traditionally from that kind of background at all have you yeah no no we can talk about that afterwards but really for me eventing this is quite rare for eventers but i actually have a passion for dressage and jumping which is very rare because you know you get a lot of, of eventers that are like oh we don't like the dressage but we love to jump and do cross country so that's why we do it but I love dressage you know I enjoy it but I also love the cross country so for me I get to do both which is great um so yeah I mean I don't really enjoy show jumping that much so um it's nice that I get to do cross country and dressage a bit of both really so it sounds to me like if you had the opportunity to do uh, dressage with some cross country, that would be your ideal. That stuff. would be ideal world. I don't know why the song about show jumping that I'm just a bit like, ah, but um, I know some people can relate because some people do find the show jumping hard. But for me, I love the dressage. I love the cross country. So. <laughs> and what is it then that you love about the dressage and the cross country? Because they are polar opposites, aren't they? They are. You know, it's like, that's what I said. It's rare, right, for someone to to enjoy those two that are completely different. For me, I just I was kind of raised. So my stepmom kind of got me into dressage um, and she loved it. So I enjoyed watching it and I really got into it. I had a lovely little dressage pony and I just I just enjoy schooling and doing stuff like that. Um, and cross country, I just love hurling myself at jumps. So like you say, it's complete opposite, but I love to run and jump. Whereas show jumping, I think, you know, you've got to think about it more. Whereas cross country, I can just be like, woo, <laughs> here I am running and jumping. But show jumping, it's like, oh my God, I've got to sit up. I've got to look this way, I've got to look that way. What stride am I going off? Cross country, I can just, doesn't matter. <laughs> So it sounds to me like then you love a little bit of the well, control is possibly the wrong word, but the the sort of the accuracy, the specifics of dressage. And then at the same time, you're not a Gemini, are you, Tati? Do you know, I'm a Leo, just uh, a Leo, just, uh, just. So a day got, off of being a Gemini. That will be why then. So there's yeah. there are two parts of you. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. As I'm a Gemini, I know this. There's the yeah, yeah. throw your knickers to the wind, yeah. love the cross country <laughs> element. And then there's the... The, the dressage, dressage. Yeah. yes, the, everything neat and tidy, doing it. That's as exactly should. it. Yeah, I do. I like the discipline of dressage and I like sitting in a nice position. But then I also think after that, I'm like, now I've done that. I want to be crazy. So <laughs> that's awesome. So we're going to come back on a little bit more about um, your journey in eventing and things. But yeah. let's just let just tell us we've alluded to it. We're all fascinated. Tell us about your background. then, Patty. What's this about polo? So my dad started playing polo when he was 18. Um, he got given I think he won like a, a lesson in a raffle or something and just went and was like, oh, it'll be a bit of a laugh and enjoyed it. It was an Epsom Polo Club and he absolutely loved it. So he's played since he was young, you know, um, and then his brother, my uncle, he played, you know, so they both played for a long time. And when I was a young child, I grew up watching my dad, you know, every weekend I was bored, sat on the sidelines, just watching him play polo. But as I grew up and, you know, I got into horses when I was, you know, I was, I was always riding when I was young, but I really got into riding when I was probably like seven or eight. And my, po you know, you can play pony club polo, which not a lot of people know. 
but a lot of pony clubs, not a lot, actually, a few pony clubs offer polo. Um, so I started doing that. I started on little ponies and then eventually went up to to bigger horses, proper polo ponies. But I mean, it's funny because when you first start out playing pony club polo, you're on tiny ponies and you've got poor parents leading these little tiny ponies down. I mean, I don't know how many of you know about polo, but a polo pitch is four times the size of a football pitch. So these poor parents are running with a leader in and a pony, so hit the bloody ball <laughs> to, their, to their kids. So it kind of started with that. And then I progressed up the levels through pony club. Um, and they do the championships at Cowdery Polo Club, which is a big polo ground um, for anyone that knows it. Um, and it was really nice because, you know, as a pony club, you know, you're little and you get to go to this huge polo club and play, you know, a championship, which is really exciting. So, um, yeah, I've always done that. You know, I was a member of the, polo, the pony club polo team for Surrey and Burstow for nearly 10 years. So, um, but at the age of 21, you can't do it anymore. So that was sad. Um, but then I still play arena polo now. So that was all grass polo, summer polo, but I play winter polo now, um, which is nice because when the eventing season kind of chills out and my horses go on holiday, I get to do a bit of winter polo. Um, so that's in the arena. The ball's a bit bigger um, and there's only three players on a team instead of four. And I enjoy that. So that's what I do now to keep up with it. But I don't play as much as I as I used to, really. So. so for those then who don't know much about polo, we've probably seen it. We might have stood at the side of an yeah, arena. Yeah, I don't really know what's going on. <laughs> drinking champagne and going out and sticking the divots in with our yeah. you know, heels every now and again, if we've even done that. Yeah. Um, so polo, for those who aren't involved in the actual game, it's very much seen as elite, aren't it? And, and you know, a lot of money involved and all sorts of things. But having experienced it yourself, especially, you know, going through pony club and bits and pieces like that. And by the way, I think I can understand why a lot of parents don't get their children into pony club polo then if they've got to run four times of a football pitch that's quite something with the little ones can you imagine they don't even score any goals the ball gets hit one way and then someone backs it the other way and the parents are like oh my god turn around back the other way that sounds fantastic fun i think if you're a parent with a child with a pony and you want to keep fit you don't need to sign to the gym just put them that's in a exactly pony it. Team. yeah exactly run up and down the pitch for seven minutes fabulous <laughs> That sounds like some kind of crazy hit, if you ask me, like, you yeah, know, hit, hit definitely. Um, high impact training thing. Yeah. <laughs> so we were, before I went aside on that question completely, it was great. Yeah, a bit more about it. Yeah, a bit more about polio and what it really involves rather than. So, yeah. So a lot of people assume that there's more players on a team than you actually think. When people say to me, how many players are on a team? And I say four. Uh, and they say, what? Really? I thought it was more than that. Um, but no, no, it's only four aside. Um and usually just four chuckers, which a lot of people are familiar with the term chucker, but don't really know what it is. So um, like in football, you get halves of games, you know, you get the first half, the second half. In polo, you get four chuckers. Um, and in high goal, you know, if it's a high level, they might play six chuckers, they might play a few more, um, but, but usually just four chuckers. And they consist of playing for seven minutes. So you play four seven minute sections of, of game. Um, and the players, it's kind of up to them, really. They choose whether they use one horse for that whole seven minutes. But a lot of the time, because it's, you know, so intense, turning, stopping, starting really quick, um, they usually use two or three horses per chucka, depending on how many ponies you have, really. So, um, so yeah, and obviously you've got your players one, two, three and four, um, and they all do different things. But it, it's, you know, it's not like netball where this person's restricted to that part. You know, everyone can go everywhere. And that's what makes it exciting is that, you know, you all run around as a pack and a lot of people um, kind of enjoy watching it because it's actually quite natural for the horses to run in a pack. That's what they enjoy doing. Um, so really, that's quite exciting and, and they do enjoy it. They love it. And so if you're a one horse owner, then is it something you can get involved in or do you need three or four? Uh, well, you know, it kind of depends if you put yourself, you know, you get the people, you know, with a lot of money who own a team and and they kind of enter the competitions and they pay the players to play with them the good players so the good players that you know start out you know they don't have a lot of money um they kind of they can borrow ponies they can rent ponies or you know over time they make money and they end up buying them but a lot of the time you know they can borrow them but definitely you know people end up owning their own horses breeding getting into that kind of thing so, you know, some of the players that I played with in Pony Club when I was little, I've now gone on to top level, you know, playing with the best in the world. And every time I see them, I'm like, never forget who you played with when you were little, because that was me. 
And so, so yeah. it's well known in places like um, Arab Emirates, you know, those kind of places, um, Argentina. They're, are they the kind of what 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 is British polo like? Because that's kind of where we mostly. Hear yeah, about. like obviously it's like other sports. You know, when you think of football, you think there's countries that absolutely love football, like as England. We love football, but we're not like the best in the world at it. Like we like to think that we are, but we still love it and love what we do. I'd say, you know, countries like Argentina, it's like a way of life out there. They absolutely love it. You know, they've got the best players in the world. That's just it. You know, and we have some of the best players in the world as well. And we love it. So I'd say like they're just a bit one up us, but we're also up there with being, you know, you know, really into the sport. And we have some really, really good players, especially, you know, young up and coming ones. Uh, yeah, it's good. And so what about then, so you've had to go and watch a lot of polo with your dad and things. Fair yes. enough. You probably didn't appreciate it when you were little. But now, if you had the chance to go and watch it somewhere, where's your like favourite place to go and watch, do you think? So I grew up watching my dad at a few different places. But the one place that, you know, I have lots of memories at watching him every weekend is the Royal Berkshire Polo Club, um, which is near us. So, um, yeah, I'd love, I mean, my dad doesn't play anymore. He doesn't really ride anymore, but... I would love to go back in time and be a kid and like you say appreciate it more and watch him and be like oh my gosh this is really cool because the riding is amazing you know as well like balance all sorts you know play into it so and so the bit a lot of people see them do is jump from one horse to another don't they have you yes did you yes bit? between chuckers yeah yeah so it's not oh just gonna swim a leg over get off walk around you know it's feet out hop onto the other horse go and did you yeah. do that yeah yeah, I can do that, but it takes a lot of mastering. There's a few fails before you can do it well. <laughs> Hopping onto you... another horse and sliding off the other end. But... Oh, totally. I can <laughs> imagine. It sounds like me trying to leg children up where I just throw them over the other side. Yeah, of the throw horse. them over the other side. That's exactly it. <laughs> and you've got a stick and a whip as well. And, you know, you have double, you have two sets of reins. So it's, ah, mix up everywhere. But once you've got it, you've got it. That sounds great fun. So what would you say then to anybody who wants to get involved in it? Where's a great place to go and learn? Because I know they don't necessarily just let you straight on a horse, do they? You've got like yeah, exactly. to stick around and stuff, haven't you? Yeah, exactly. Do you know, we've got some really good family friends that own a really lovely place called Ash Farm um, in Ottershaw. Perfect place to start. You know, you don't, like you say, you don't have to have ever ridden a horse before, but they'll give you, you know, like a two hour session and you start on the ground and then they give you a riding lesson and then you can play games with the ball. And it's, it's in an arena, so like winter polo, so it's all safe horses are lovely you know I would encourage anyone to give it a go if they like the look of it you know whether you've ridden or not it's such a fun and different thing to do and it's also a good group activity because you know you can have single lessons but I would recommend you know getting a group like do you know what would be a nice thing to do maybe for like a yard Christmas do get a group of you together and go down to one of these places and book a session a two-hour session and just have fun and do something different you know we do the same stuff with our horses all the time it's nice to actually give something else a go and you'd love to see how funny it is watching your friends try and hit a ball off a horse it is really comedy gold <laughs> and so sometimes in films and television programs and things we see these like practice like barrels that they sit on and then they and they're in a cage or something and they just practice hitting yeah the yeah ball. Is that, and there's almost like a ball on um sometimes on a bit of elastic and it just pings back yeah they've got one of those at ash farm in ottershaw um and you know they have four balls for the four different shots that you play so one front right front left and then back and you can just keep hitting and the balls keep coming back at you uh, and it doesn't matter if you hit the horse with the stick and that's what most people are scared of you know it's like the biggest fear when when i say i play polo people say well what if you hit the horse with the stick and i'm like but once you're on the horse you don't do it like it just is something that doesn't happen because in your brain you're like don't hit the horse and eventually you just understand how the swing works it's not croquet by the way that's another thing that a lot of people think is you hit the ball on the end of the stick but no you hit it at the mid so that's the stick there you don't hit it from the top there you hit it hit it from there so don't ah. play croquet guys it's polo not croquet <laughs> <laughs> i think croquet sounds a lot of subdued we had that at the wedding we didn't have polo <laughs> no <laughs> it would be very difficult to try and play croquet off a horse as well yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah I think there's too many trippy bits. And Not stuff, for me. Yeah. yeah, no, that's fair enough. <laughs> 
Cool. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, polo sounds fascinating and interesting. So what is it then that meant that you took the leap from polo, this real high octane team sport, you know, with all this stuff, this background you've got doing really well at it and things to eventing, which is a lot more in singular, you know, yeah, you've got the different phases. Yeah. Things, but what, what was it that meant you made that? Leap? Yeah. As you say, you know, you kind of going from doing a team sport to doing something like very individual. Um, I've grown up on this polo yard my whole life. No one ever, apart from me, has been here, has jumped or done anything else. And it was actually my stepmom who got me into it because she evented when she was young to intermediate level. Um, so she, as I was growing up, you know, she let, you know, I played polo, but as well, she was like, well, why don't we get her a little pony club pony? She can do a bit of polo on and she can jump as well. So I was like, oh, okay. So I started doing a bit of jumping. And, you know, when you're little, you're crazy. Like most people when they're young and they've got a pony that, you know, I would have jumped over the, the moon and back if I could but now I'm like oh my gosh so yeah I kind of got into jumping that way and I had another little pony as well that was like a dressage pony so that was the thing for me you know I got the best of both worlds I had two ponies one that did dressage and one that did a bit of jumping and polo and in the end I was like you know I swayed towards polo for a very long time um, and ended up kind of not really jumping and just doing the polo and then you know you hit that certain age 16 17 and I was like oh well I want a social life not really interested in the pony so we sold one and then Jemima she was quite old the, the jumping pony so she retired um and then you know everything kind of stopped for a bit I didn't ride for a very long time um and then I kind of hit this point where I was getting kind of these mental health problems you know a bit of anxiety and it started getting bad I don't know whether it was hormonal or what I just went through a phase of being just unhappy and I think it's because I went through that stage of not having horses in my life and I was just like you know what I want another horse um and I said I want a jumping horse this time I want an all-rounder that does a bit of everything and then I found an advert this lovely colored horse and I thought oh he's nice you know he does eventing I've never looked into eventing you know hunter trials but never like proper eventing went to look at him and then the rest is history now <laughs> and so that lovely colored horse of that oreo that is Oreo, oh, yeah, so my, my pride about, and joy. Oh, tell us more about Oreo and the journey that you two have had together then. So when I got him, the, the girl who was selling him, she had another horse that she wanted to focus on and she kind of, you know, she was moving up onto novice and above and she thought she kind of maxed out with Oreo. Um, my dad was like, you're not buying that thing, it's fat, it doesn't move. And I said, no, like, I know he can be good, he's really special. My dad's like, no, I know what my dad's like. Because, you know, polo ponies are all skinny and, you know, you top that athletes very flashy you know muscles and then he goes to see this like little fat jumping pony that would barely go over a cross pole and my dad was like no no it's fat and I was like please like I know this one's the right one um anyway got training got moving and now he's in perfect shape you know I saw I saw what he could have and I saw what he'd done and I was like you know this is you know this horse can do it um and eventually we just kind of trained up kept working really hard with a few different people and now we're kind of flying. <laughs> and so I love that, the fact that you, your dad said, no, he's a fat little. Did he use the word cow pony? Because that's what sprung into my head. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He kind of, well, when we first got there, it was like a disapproving look. I was like, yeah, this is because I've already gone to see Oreo with my stepmom. And then I said, right, I'll take my dad. And my dad was like, OK. And then afterwards, we got in the car and he was like, this thing's fat. <laughs> I was like, yeah, but he can lose weight. And he was like, oh, it's slow, lazy. What do you want that thing for? He needs a good whip up the ass, blah, 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 you know, like that. And I was like, no, I like him. I think he's cute. And my dad was like, oh, for God's sake, like, whatever, if you want it, get it. But. <laughs> and so what was it then that meant that you, you saw that in Oreo and you knew what that little pony could do? Do you know, so I went to try him three times before I bought him and went to see him that many times. And after the first time I looked into him a bit more so I got went home and looked up his breeding and stuff and I saw that his his name was Clover Hill Prince and as a lot of people know you know Clover Hill is a is a great line of jumping pony and I knew I wanted something Irish because I just I have this thing for Irish horses I just love them I think they're hardy I think they do everything you want them to do they don't really turn their nose up at anything they're just crazy and they're they're easy to have looked into him more had great breeding you know had come come over from Ireland done a lot of stuff and I thought He's done it. He can do it. He can get back into shape. This is the one. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. I yeah. do love Irish horses too. I know, just something about massive, them, isn't oh, it? This the brain, I think. I know. Yeah, that is it. The brain. Yeah. 
I've had a um, King of Diamonds, and then my current one is a Clover Hill as well. So I'm oh totally yes, two in really nice Irish fan club. <laughs> yeah, we are. I will, you know, my all the horses I have will hopefully probably be Irish. I just just love them. So um, just out of interest, because interestingly enough, my first horse, Monty, was actually um, a polo pony. Well, he was bred for polo, and he was an Arab cross oh. quarter horse, which is, I oh. call him a quarab. A quarab. Um, <laughs> right down that. in the New Forest at New Park, down at their polo ground. Um, yeah. And the whole of his family were bred to do polo, but he was sold as a two-year-old because they were overstocked. Um, yeah. But he was a, a hardy little thing but could not be more different to an Irish horse. So what really? would you say was the differences between the kind of the polo breeding and ponies that you've ridden and, and Oreo yeah. the Irish boy? The Oreo the Irish boy. Well, do you know what's funny? Because obviously I'm the only jumping one in the yard. You know, we've got lots of Argentine grooms here that come over for the seat, for the English season to look after the horses. And, you know, they walk past on these skinny athletic horses and they look at him and they go, Gordo, Gordo. And in Spanish, that means fat pig. <laughs> he's not even that fat anymore I thought he was in good shape so when they call him Gordo I'm like oh my gosh like they must think he's huge but anyway um bit off topic I think you know the main difference if when you look at them next to each other the polo ponies they're quite similar to racehorses in a way that you know they've got skinny fine necks um a lot of people say they look underweight but honestly a lot of them are just in you know they're in good condition and a lot of their breeding is is just a bit like that just a bit small a bit like me I'd say as a horse because I'm just skinny and just don't put weight on ever just a bit like that um yeah they're skinny you know they're very muscular though particularly their bums you see a lot of shape in their bums um and their necks are really fine you know when you sit on a polo pony you feel like you're going to topple over the top because they're so like small Whereas when I sit on Aurea, you know, it's a bit wider. Your legs feel wider apart because it's suddenly the belly goes, woo. <laughs> so I think the main thing for me is like the necks, how fine and short they are. Um, but, you know, I always say these polo ponies would do a lovely dressage chest because their walk decanters are, and their changes, smooth as. So <laughs> one day I'll still want and convert it to what I want it to be. <laughs> yeah, maybe there's a, maybe there's, um, you know, you've got ROR, maybe we should have... Um... P-O-R. P-O-R, yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Well, a lot of our polo ponies, so our ones have come from Argentina, but, you know, a lot of the people that keep their horses at our yard, their polo ponies, they are ex-race horses. So many ex-race horses in polo, which I think is really nice because it, it gives them another chance. And they're great because they can still, you know, run fast and do what they've got to do. They just didn't make it in racing. Oh, that's really cool. And so what kind of size are they, though? Because polo ponies traditionally are actually quite small, aren't they? They are. Do you know, our ones, because my cousin who plays them is, is quite small, like me. Um, ours are probably only about 14, 2 to 15 hands. So little, you know, they're ponies. Um, but some of the other ones on our yard are up to kind of 15, 3, but they don't go any bigger than that. You know, you don't see giant polo ponies because the stick would be very long, a bit like elephant polo <laughs> or camel polo. Um, so, yeah, they don't really go above 15, 3, um, really. And it's really interesting, isn't it? Because a lot of people do think they are ponies, which you've just said some of them are, but mostly they yeah. are actually small horses. And yeah. these big honking great guys ride them around, don't they? I know. Yeah, yeah. Some of these guys are big. Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, the fitness, the, the training that they go through is is amazing to watch them kind of transform because, you know, they come in, they they spend the whole winter out in the field. They get the whole winter off. Um, they come in these fluffy things, a bit fat, you know, looking a bit scruffy, and then suddenly they transform into this top athlete, you know, muscular, can run for for ages, you know, it's it's amazing. And so seeing what, because it's a bit like event horses, they rough them off over the winter potentially, and then they bring them back in. So having yeah. seen that yourself and being a part of that, how much of that kind of bringing back into work um, ethos and maybe you've got an... Um, would you say that you're able to do and the, uh, part of the reason I'm asking this is actually because there's a lot of horses out there at the moment that are going to have been roughed off for a couple of months yeah. now before people start bringing them back in so what would you say are the kind of key things to bringing a horse back into work again in that respect yeah so I think it, it's kind of different for every horse isn't it some people don't like to turn them out some horses it doesn't suit to turn them out for a long time um but for me I think it's so good for their heads. Like it did Oriole world of good. And I'm so glad I've had that opportunity to be able to turn him out in a field, you know, and go and live in a herd, like a real horse. You know, he's gone out with a huge herd of like 30 horses in a massive field and, and lived the feral life, which is really nice. Um, but as for bringing them back into work, I actually feel like he came back into work with such a positive and yeah, I want to do this attitude. Whereas before, like sometimes he was getting a bit flat towards the end of the season and a bit like, oh, tired and, 
a bit fed up. So it's really good for their brain. And I actually find when they come back into work, they come back into work, you know, even more enthusiastic, which is nice. Um, and for anyone wanting to kind of, you know, thinking about doing that with their horse, you know, should I turn them out and bring them back? You know, depending on how long you put them out for a long holiday, yes, they're going to lose fitness and muscle, but a short holiday, if you turn them out for two weeks, they, they don't lose as much fitness as you think. So sometimes that holiday can actually really improve their way of going once they come back in. And so what kind of things, what kind of exercises would the polo guys be using? Might be slightly different to eventing, I don't know. Or are they very yeah, similar so, to bring a so horse when, back? So when they bring them back in, they either go on the walker, they walk for ages. That's the, that's the key thing, you know, is a lot of walking. You know, walking, they start for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour of just walking, walking, walking until they do, you know, an hour of walking. And then because we've got an exercise track, a lot of polo yards have a big exercise track. Ours is 800 metres, so they'll do... 20 minutes of walking and then they'll do a lap of trot and canter stop that's it and then a walk off back in and then it, it's a bit like you know I, I assume a lot of people in eventing do something similar but on a kind of different way um you know lots of walking and then just slowly introducing longer periods of canter because the thing is with polo ponies they don't really trot canter and then trot again canter trot it's walk or canter so they'll canter a lap stop and then the next week canter two laps for the week stop canter three weeks so it just builds up over time and, and once you know we go at the level we think they're comfortable with as well you know if we think the horses are ready to do a bit more then we'll step it up if not we'll step it back down so that's really cool so it sounds like your place then has got some things that are really specific for polo but actually yeah. at the same time if you can get access to those kind of facilities somewhere mega helpful for other things as well so definitely an exercise track so what what's an exercise track then what would you call so, that yeah sorry that a lot of people probably aren't familiar with that they don't have it on their livery yard an exercise track is a bit like how you'd imagine like um how the racehorses practice so it's a big kind of fenced oval for us um which has a rubber and sand surface on it it's 800 meters so it's basically just a big track a big oval so you can just walk trot canter whatever you want around it um it's probably about 10 meters wide so not because the problem is with polo you know you lead a few horses at a time when you exercise a polo pony you're riding one horse leading two on one side leading two on the other so actually 10 meters isn't a lot of space so you kind of like ride in a line or we select times at which you know people go out there and exercise their horses but for me, I've got a nice wide track that I can go for a gallop round. I'm not holding more horses, so I could use all the space in the world. It's great. Um, and yeah, you know, I can really use those facilities to my advantage because I get to train on polo pitches on grass, which is great. Jump on grass, dressage on grass, do a bit of gallop on the surface. I mean, it couldn't be more ideal, really, for an event rider. That's so cool. And isn't it? It's really nice. I mean, obviously, they're amazing facilities, but being resourceful this is something we're all having to do right now isn't it yes being yeah. resourceful and thinking about how you can use what you've got and the resources that you've got to be able to do what it is that you need to be able to do is really key isn't it to it to... is so yeah. i, I want to know a bit more about oreo then so you've told us how you got him and then what did you do what's the next chapter of oreo's journey the little fat cow pony arrived at your yard the little fat cow pony arrived at my yard next to my dad's, dad's disgust. Disgust. <laughs> yeah yeah just looking at this thing like oh god you know lunged him the first week or so you know just getting him used to the farm and all the machinery and whatnot my dad's like oh god what is this thing like just she's plodding around and I'm like this he wouldn't even go on the bit so he's flinging his head in the air trotting around and my dad's like oh god like what have I done um but you know I got into training I got training with a good friend who's a top dressage rider she was really helping me you know get used to him and, and that's what everyone does when they first get a horse get used to them and and get to know them a bit better I did some horsemanship stuff with him just to kind of get bonding a bit better I really was like keen to get a bond with him because he was a bit like shy at first and wasn't really bothered um and then you know I threw myself in at the deep end which is what I love to do and I was like I'm gonna sign up and do BE next year so in January I signed up to do BE that season and then it kind of got closer to the time and I was like what have I done like I've never done a proper like one day event I've done hunter trials but I've never really done a proper event I don't know what I'm doing really really nervous like and anyway our first event we came 11th out of quite a big section of like 30 so I was like wow I think this could be our thing and then we carried on kept training um and it's just gone on from there really we've just gone up and up and up and you know he's kind of one of those being there done that ponies he's he's going to be 17 soon so he's an old man but he won't like me saying that um but he's still just as capable now so 
it's nice because he's taught me what he already knows and has helped me through it. But I've just got his fitness up a little bit because he was a bit of a piggy. <laughs> and so how long ago did you get him now? So, oh my gosh, 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20. Yeah. So I've had him, this will be the fourth year I got him in October. And when did you start actually eventing with him that first year the, the first year 2017 yeah deep end I was like that's it I'm going for it you know and I think that's like a key thing I think people if they're umming and ahhing about maybe thinking oh should I do this with him or should I do that with him can I do it yes you can just you know if you don't think you're capable of being thrown at the deep end okay don't do it but start off doing something little and work your way up you know I just think that's for me that was the best way to do it just get on with it because if you beat around the bush and think oh should I should I you won't do it. That's so true. And and actually, Caroline Moore was talking about that. I don't know if you managed to see her Q&A. Yeah, yeah. You've watched it back. But that's exactly what she was talking about, which is actually just go and do it, but make sure you're safe. Like, make sure you yeah, have the yeah. skills and the capabilities. Like, don't go doing something crazy that you exactly. don't know how to do. But yeah, you know, actually feel the fear and do it anyway is a bit of a, a, a thing. Yes. About, isn't it and love you know, that much as I'm not a massive fan of the guy himself but Ant Middleton's book The Fear Bubble is very interesting I don't know if you've read it yes do you know what my boyfriend said she just read that book so yeah and it's about yeah. you've got bubbles of fear and you have to go into them and pop them to know that they've gone and come back yeah. out again and know that you're okay and it is it's about that though isn't it it's about thinking about what your skills are you know yeah. what are you good at and yeah like you say you as long as it's safe just throw yourself in there and do it because you know, you're going to come out the other end absolutely fine if you're doing it safely, you know, and I think it was yesterday in, with the lady that you were speaking to yesterday on the live Q&A is, you know, just push, you know, turn your fear kind of into excitement, you know, you know, turn it around because that's the thing, I, you know, I get nervous and I think, oh, before a competition, I can't sleep, I can't eat the night before and I'm like, oh God, if I haven't eaten, I'm going to be all weak tomorrow and if I don't sleep, I'm going to be all weak. But if you twist that around and turn it into actually, this is going to be fun. The reason I'm doing this is because I love what I do and I love doing stuff with my horse. Turn it around and turn it into something positive. And it's usually, you know, always going to be a positive outcome. And that's when you get success is from being positive and just enjoying what you're doing with your horse. And it's so lovely that your passion comes through. You're clearly so incredibly passionate about what you do and about Oreo. And I know you've got another horse as well, Buzz. Tell us a little yes. bit about Buzz. Oh, he's lovely. So Buzz was actually born in our back garden. So I've lived in the same place my whole life. Buzz was born here. So we watched him come out. He's very special. So he had a full older sister who was born before him. Absolutely psychotic, just horrible horse. So we thought when the next one came out, oh God, what's this one going to be like? He couldn't be more the opposite. He is just a big, gentle giant. He's 17 hands, but he's just, just so gentle and cuddly, always wants cuddles, just pesters you for treats. Like, he's a big boy as well. He's fat, and my dad's like, oh, another one. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, he's lovely. He went off because he was kind of broken in when I lost interest and preferred a social life over horses. So he went off and did some, some stuff with the show jumpers, um, jumped 120s, 130s, um, and unfortunately got an injury a couple of years ago now. Um, so I brought him back here and he's just going to stay here with me now um, and do some small stuff. And it's just building him back up. But him and Oreo are a bit of a nightmare together. They lead each other astray, naughty in the field, can't be caught. Two boys. <laughs> I wouldn't have it any other way, though. I love boys. Yeah, absolutely. And so you've got your two naughty boys. One of them has to go and do a job and the other one just stays at home. Take, yeah, take I do what I want. Straight and narrow. Yeah, yeah. Does what he wants. Get us away with murder. Yeah. Oh, bless them. <laughs> so, OK. So obviously we're in a bit of a funny place at the moment with what's going on and things. Yeah. Being not, but tell us a little bit like when you applied to the ambassador scheme with Flying Changes at the beginning of the year, I just loved your story. I loved your background. <laughs> I loved your passion clearly comes through. And um, you had some lovely aspirations and goals and things that you want to achieve, which are obviously still there. It's just yeah. temporarily on hold right now. So tell yeah. us a bit more about what, what the future holds. So short term, I was hoping, so last year I got my regional final tickets um, to hopefully go to badminton. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do the regional finals this year. That is my big or oh. um, so short term. I would absolutely love to get Oreo to badminton. You know, he's, he's, not a spring chicken anymore so I'd really like to kind of slow his career down after we got to badminton and just do do smaller things and less with him um so really for me that is my current drive like 
there's no way I'm not going to badminton. Like I have to get there. I have to, have to, have to get in there. Um, that would be really important to me. And I just love to do it. Um, and kind of long-term, I would like to get, you know, further up the levels, maybe get another horse. I would like to, you know, my ultimate dream, which I think I put in my application was um, just to compete in tails. Doesn't matter what I do, dressage or eventing, I'd love to compete in tails. And that's what I'd really, really love to do. And like, you know, I said earlier, I have a passion for dressage and eventing. So whether it's either one of those, I don't know what the future holds. But right now it's badminton. And then after that, I can think, you know, more specific routes of what I want to do. Um, but as long as it's tails, it's fine. <laughs> That's really cool. And they're the kind of goals that we love. The tails. Well, yeah. we'll get on to badminton in a minute. But the tails yeah. one's awesome because it's got it's it's what we call artfully vague. It's got enough specificity. It's quite a good weather one. Um <laughs> to it. So like you'll know you're doing it because you're riding in tails. So mm -hmm. it's quite obviously a yes, no goal. However, where, when, how, in what discipline or anything like that is so totally flexible that like yeah. you will achieve the goal somehow because you yeah. can for all different routes in which you could do it. Yeah, we'll, we'll make it there one way. It doesn't yeah. matter how or what I'm doing, but if it's in tails, then it's is of one. <laughs> and you'll be joining quite a lot of us. I think we're going to have a tails party one day. There's quite yes. a few of us in the team that that's our goal. It's a funny old goal, isn't it? What is it about <laughs> tails that means we want you to know, ride? I don't even know what it is. It's just really special. Like when you see people riding in tails, when I see the top riders, I'm like, you look the dogs. Like you just look awesome. Like for me, I've made is. it. That's what it is, isn't it? It just looks so beautiful. It looks so elegant, the yeah. way they drape. They, it just, yeah, you're right. It just, and they bob around on the tail as they're doing their pirouettes and their fancy stuff. And I'm just like, oh, I want that to be me one day. <laughs> and it's no good if you're just doing the fancy stuff. It has to be in a tailcoat. <laughs> it has to be in a tailcoat. Absolutely. has to be. So um, badminton then. So that's interesting because that's what we call a product goal. So that's a yes, no um so you know what is it about badminton what is it about getting there the journey what is it about it itself the essence of it that's important to you as a goal because it may or may not actually happen itself but we could still achieve some of the stuff that you want from it along the way so tell us yeah. more about what that's about so obviously everyone knows badminton you know amazing place you know top five star riders you know one of the top events in the world you know um just really exciting the word badminton makes me excited for a lot of non-horsey people that just means a, a funny game with a racket and a net but for me that's just like oh my god you know for event riders the word badminton just gets anyone excited um and a, a lot of us have obviously been to watch it live and the fact that there's an opportunity for grassroots riders to be there and do something you know you ride next to the the five star track nearly most of the way which i think is just amazing so for me that was like wow like I would love to do that and, and like you say there's no guarantee that you're gonna get there you know you've got to really work hard but those regional final sections are so competitive um so making sure I'm ready for those is going to be really really important and and absolutely smash it because there's no way I'm taking no for an answer <laughs> what do you mean I haven't qualified <laughs> so looking at that then okay so we don't know when it's going to be or we can't plan specifically at the no. moment what would you say are going to be your key elements? What are you going to be your team? Where are the skills that you need to improve on? What is your plan that's really going to get you there? We're giving away some secrets now, perhaps. Anyone who's looking like, oh, yeah. we've got Pleasure to is. Careful, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. Um, so skills, for me, obviously there's going to be like horse training and, and lessons and whatnot. But for me, mentally, I would like to really overcome my nerves. Um and stress around that because sometimes I feel like that gets the better of me and it can affect my performance not all the time because most of the time it doesn't but for something like badminton or a regional final which I know is important because you know that's how your brain works when they know that's important and you can't be let down today that's when it all goes wrong um you know keeping myself under control and I think that's what a lot of people struggle with even top riders is is keeping their nerves from affecting their you know their performance um, so really, that's something I'd like to work on, which we can we can go through. Uh, and I've already been trying to crack and it's been a lot better. So hopefully. But the problem is I haven't been able to go to any competitions and practice what I what I want to um, on trying to control it. So that's one key skill that I would like to to smash through. Um, and I think one of the other ones I spoke about was um, the warm up, being in the warm up. And one problem I really have with myself is my my self-esteem and my belief in myself. You know, when I see other horses in the warm up, I think, 
oh god I can never compete against them they look really good look at them how am I ever going to compete with them but actually most of the time that's not the key the you know the case um so really self-esteem and nerve issues if I smash those we're there <laughs> Oh, well, luckily you're on the right team for that then. We will yeah, exactly. get cracking. Make sure you get your sessions booked in, Tati, and we'll be doing that now. Because yeah. now it is exactly when you can be working on that Perfect stuff. Okay. You may not be able to go and test it because you may not be able to go to a competition and test it in that respect, but you can start laying the groundwork and changing the patterns in your brain now so that there, it's like, it's what we call a flywheel. I don't know if you've ever heard of a flywheel, but a flywheel is something that you, you it takes a lot of effort to get it going sometimes to begin with mm-hmm. um well a flywheel does take a lot but once it's going it gets its own momentum and then it just keeps going with just continually and it can feel sometimes like it takes a lot of effort to get it going to begin with but that's where a great coach or someone comes in to actually just give the push to get that the extra push yeah yeah because um, we know exactly where to pull on that pot flywheel to get it turning when it might be stuck or at a standstill yeah. right now so here's the cool part that I know you're aware of and we are going to be doing some stuff on it during the lockdown is mm-hmm. that you know you can start start making that happen now so that it's then going so that by the time you get to test it at competition yeah it's, it's already doing its thing yeah the patterns Absolutely. have changed the brain has already changed you can notice it in other things so one of the questions I did have for you on that is you did say I've already started doing some stuff that started to make a difference but obviously I haven't been able to test it what what stuff is it that you've already been doing that you found has made a difference because maybe there's some bits there that other people can start thinking about at the moment yeah so it's kind of like my thought process and just you know picking my thought process apart up to a competition so before all this happened we'd already spoken so I did manage to go to a couple of like show jumping competitions and to be honest I get mostly nervous for the show jumping competitions just because um I'm don't like it and I'm not very I say I'm not very good at that I shouldn't say that because it's not very positive but um I just have this belief just like to check you on that one um when you say you're not very good at it what happened at your last show jumping competition well I came first so (laughs) so can we change that here we go yeah here we go okay I'm 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 getting there with it and we're working on it and it's going well so far um so what I have put into practice is picking my thought process apart so oh my gosh, the night before or on the day, I'm really, really nervous. Oh my gosh, you've got to pack the lorry. I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Right. Um, so picking it apart, it's normal to be nervous. 99% of people who compete are nervous just because that's how it is. That's how our, our body works. We're humans. Um, secondly, like, what are you actually nervous about? So me, right. What am I actually nervous about? Oh, getting there on time. What if I forget some equipment? Um, what if I don't have time to warm up properly? like and then so the last part kind of picking my thoughts apart what really matters like does this really matter does it matter if you don't win does it matter if you have a bad day and don't do so well you might you know fall off or have a pole or whatever but ultimately that doesn't matter like what really matters for me is you know that's how what I've been doing is reminding myself why I'm here what matters I enjoy myself I achieve the goals that I want to achieve for the day. And if I haven't, no pressure, that doesn't matter, you know? So picking apart my thought process and kind of taking the pressure off, you know, it doesn't matter how well you do. You're here for fun with your horse. So so that's how I've started it. And, you know, there's a few other things that I want to try as well. So we'll see. What other things do you want to try? So what other things do I want to try the thing about the warm-up and the self-esteem problems so I haven't really had the chance to practice this it's mainly in the dressage warm-up at an event um it's kind of doing my own warm-up so what watching what other people are doing in their warm-up and practice what you know helps warm your horse up the best you know don't look at them and think oh she's doing that do you think I should be doing that no you know you at that moment I'm the only person in there focus on yourself and your horse and how they go um, and don't look at other people on what they're doing because too often that's the mistake I've made and I've gone in you know gone down the center line being completely unprepared because I've been too worried about what the person over there is doing and not what I'm doing <laughs> that's so totally common as well and I know there's loads of others in the team that have actually gotten over exactly that so yeah, yeah I mean it's 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 really interesting hearing the fact that you're in the middle of this I mean no one's ever out the other side like even <laughs> even yeah. I it's like Adele and I were saying yesterday like you're always on a journey with this stuff you're always learning things and yeah, you know always. those of us that are, are training to be able to do this with other people like we we go through something we think yes I'm fixed amazing and then like yeah. a few months later something really intense we think I'm actually just uh... 
Never yeah, mind. what's going Next on? Lesson. Yeah. Again, I actually, you know, I went to watch some show jumping with my boyfriend, and he he asked a uh, an interesting question. I can't remember. It was along the lines of something like, um, but why, you know, why do they need trainers if they're a top rider? You know, if they're the best, why do they need a coach? And it's like, well even the best of the best in the world have coaches there's always something you can improve on most of the time things aren't perfect you know there's always something you can work on um so you know everyone you know like you say it's an ongoing journey there's always something we can do there's always something more and that's the thing that I'm pleased with my attitude that's changed recently is you know oh you did really well in this test right let's go home and improve even more on those things and start working on the other things you know there's always something I can do and I love that attitude and that's why we picture as part of the team because it's that exact attitude that Caroline's been talking about, that Adele mm-hmm. was talking about, that everyone is talking about is the thing that really gives you the edge as a competitor in this sport is yes, skills and horse are important, but it's having that attitude of there is always something I can learn, there is always something yeah. I can improve on. That doesn't mean, I mean, I work with a lot of clients that are so like that, they've gone really far, but then they've forgotten to stop, smell the roses and celebrate success. So we have to, we have to do yeah, the yeah. with them. We have to go stop celebrate your success yeah you've done well yeah. well done like <laughs> stop for a moment before you can't you go, do anything yet yeah, yeah before you, you just keep the yeah but it's not good enough is it and I have to say I I was very much um in that camp which was the even if I'd gone on one stuff and done really well and everyone's going oh my god that's amazing I'm going yeah I know but it could have been better though couldn't it you know yeah yeah I know exactly what you mean there's a flip side to everything isn't there it's funny yeah. that balance isn't there between mm. driving and wanting and I think it's a timing thing you know mm-hmm. If you when you did really well at your show jump competition and you won your class and you said, Yay, it's amazing, I won, I'm so pleased. You didn't then go home and go, Well, I'm done, that's it, thanks. You stopped, you celebrated, and yeah. then you looked at what needed to improve going forwards. That so was exactly it's, it, yeah. It's about that timing, isn't it? It's not it's not just like um, yay, I've done well, but it's not good enough either. It's yay, I've done well, pause, stop, take the moment, enjoy it for a little bit, now move on. What's the next thing I can do? Yeah. So, I think that's one of the things that's changed a bit for you, hasn't it? Yeah, definitely. And and what I saw once was, um, you know, some of the top riders, once they've, they've ridden their cross-country course or even show jumpers or dressage, they watch what they've done back, you know, on video and think, right, what could I have done better? Um, even if they've won, they might watch their cross-country round and think, right, there, I should have done this, should have done that. Um, but like you say, there's a balance, you know, you don't want to be too hard on yourself. Oh, I've won. But, you know, you want to enjoy the success. You don't want to think, oh, I've won. But it wasn't very good, you know, enjoy what you've got. And then you can start to, you know, fine tune little things that you want to do better, but don't beat yourself up ever. Yeah, exactly. And that's such a great attitude to have. And and I dare say an attitude you've probably been brought up with if you've been from a family that are competitive in the way that they are, Mm -hmm. but I was very successful and enjoying life as well. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to enjoy what you've got because, you know, life won't be happy if you just don't have time to enjoy it. So Cool. And I think that's probably a really good note to finish on, actually, Tati. Thank yeah. you so much. We've covered some really interesting topics. Mm-hmm. Um, there have been some lovely comments from people saying hi, especially the guys in the team. Um, uh, hi, everyone. <laughs> and I'm sure there'll probably be some more questions and comments coming through when people are able to watch this back. So yeah. um, this slot sometimes is just people are just busy at this time, aren't they? So Yes, yeah, so they watch it back and I'll, I'll you know look at the comments later. If anyone else has any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Absolutely. And also on the podcast, if people want to get a hold of you after this, what's your Facebook, Instagram or way of contacting you? So my Instagram is at tattywaldridge.eventing. And that is also my Facebook um, like URL thing that you can type in as well. Not many people have the name Tatty Waldridge. So when you type it in, it, it comes up straight away. <laughs> cool. And they can find you through, obviously, our Instagram and things we follow. Yeah, you and stuff. exactly. Yeah. Fab. Amazing. Thank you so much Perfect. for your time this morning. Tati. No it's problem. Been- very very interesting it's great thoughts wonderful mindset and very interesting background as well yes thank you for having me thanks then <laughs> bye bye